Hello. This lecture is about something controversial um, for some. And it's about child spacing, family planning, population development. Should we limit population development? But uh, sit back and relax and just let the, the facts flow and um, we'll build a judgment afterwards. So there are known and uh, described benefits of family planning, meaning child spacing largely. So if you uh, reduce the number of children that you have by uh, making them the intervals between them wider, you have a series of uh, these advantages that the WHO lists on their web page and that are widely known in public health. First of all, you prevent pregnancy-related deaths not only from abortion and unwanted pregnancy, but also from the risk of pregnancy. So the lifetime risk to die of a pregnancy is, of course, larger if you have, let's say, 15 deliveries or if you have six. Plus, you recover better, and maternal health is hugely influenced by the number and the spacing of deliveries that a woman has. But also the children that are born survive better if the next children and the next child doesn't come a year after. So the, the space between two births is key for child survival. It helps to prevent HIV AIDS. We all know that using condoms, for example, is also good for preventing HIV AIDS. Empowering people because they are in control of their, uh, of their fertility, both women and men. Enhancing education, we know from our education colleagues that children uh, who are spaced more than three years have a better school performance and better cognitive development than others who are um, with lower birth uh, spaced, uh, spaces. We reduce adolescent pregnancies because we want to cut also on the lower end and not have girls of 14 and 15 get pregnant. And we slow population growth. Is this needed? Is this not needed? We will, we will see, because that is what WHO says. That is the health-related um, effects. I wanted to give you some data. Sometimes we need to have some data on the infant mortality birth interval relationship. And here you see that uh, if you have a birth interval of one year, you have almost double, not only almost, you have more than double the infant mortality of these children than if you have a birth interval of four. In fact, you have exactly the double if you have compared to a birth interval of three. It's an old study. It has been replicated so often. So uh, we do something for health if we reduce uh, the number of children and if we increase the birth interval. As you see, all my talk is about a health co-benefit of climate policy, and I want to convince you that even in climate policy, it makes sense to limit population growth. So on the benefits for non-health sectors, we looked at WHO so far. Now let's look at other health sectors. Our education colleagues say it's better for school performance. The economists tell us you have an economic growth um, uh, stimulus if you have a lowering in children. In fact, what China is living, this, this enormous uh, economic uh, explosion, you might even say, is partly due to the demographic dividend of reducing population growth. Of course, they did it with a very special and very controversial sort of constraint, but uh, this can be done uh, also in other ways. The essential is that uh, having a lower population growth is also good for economic growth. Natural resource conservation, we are talking about water, we are talking about um, space and forests and so forth. That's also what our environmentalists tell us. And finally, the climate. Is the climate also an argument, in addition to all these other sectors, to think about population growth and to try to limit it on a voluntary basis? So how do we get from population, from the number of people, to greenhouse gas emissions? And uh, this shows you in one line how this works, and it's multiplicative. That means you have to multiply all these factors. To the right, you see the population. The number of population determines, with other factors, greenhouse gas emissions. Then comes the next is uh, the economic activity per person, gross domestic product. 
That is how um, much people, countries grow economically. The next uh, factor is the energy that each unit of activity, economic activity contains. That's about energy efficiency. The next to the left is then the carbon content, uh, content of this um, energy. So this is how you multiply one after another you get from population to greenhouse gas emission. So it doesn't determine it alone, but it is one of four factors, and we should bear this in mind. And then it percolates down to greenhouse gas emissions, concentrations, climate change, and the green part of this kind of cascade is the health parts. We get exposed or not, we get diseased or not, we die or not, and uh, you see in the brown part how we can sort of stop this inexorable march from greenhouse gas emissions to death, which is a little bit dramatic. But there are many stops we can uh, control. And of course, we want to influence mitigation policies and stop uh, the increasing greenhouse gases. So population on the very top right is important. You see, in addition, that world population projections have increased. They have gone up uh, by 3 billion, just an aside, within, within 10 to 15 years. This is a very recent publication from the very prestigious journal Nature, which, sh which shows that they predict at the end of the century world population to be at 11 billion. Now, before, when, when I was working in, in the IPCC and in other organizations, it was always 9 billion. That was the UN projection. That's the, the, the line below. And the climate models, not the current generation, but the previous generation, uh, used 7 billion in their projections. So we, we, we treated these billions a little bit lightly, and it's so different whether you have 11 billion in, in uh, climate projections compared to 7 billion. So if anything, that's the take-home message, if anything, population projections have increased. We are currently at 7, currently already. So we, we have more than 50% more to add to what we already have. And these are mainly in Africa. You see here the same projections by continent from the same paper. You see that uh, the kind of uh, yellow part, brownish yellow part is Asia. It will peak by 2050 and then sort of plateau off, whereas Africa has an unrelented uh, growth until the end of the century and doesn't plateau. So this is not uh, irrelevant for our debate because Africa, as we know, has a lot of health problems, and so has Asia. And by multiplying people, uh, by, by adding a substantial number of people to this, doesn't help um, managing health and managing the climate. And that is reflected now in a recent paper by The Lancet, who look at different um, scenarios. For example, here it's an exposure of, uh, of people to extreme events. And you see the timeline on the bottom. You see the blue curve is uh, without taking into account this population increase. So it's moderate. It's uh, one billion exposures per year more. It's, well, it's moderate in comparison. But if you go the red line by including population projections, you have the triple. So we cannot just sit back and ignore this because it may not be politically correct to talk about population policy. How do we do this? Certainly not by, by uh, legislation or by state influence. It must be voluntary. And here is uh, one fact that comes to our help. If you have the World Fertility Survey, you ask all households all over the world, what is your desired family size and what is the family size you have or you ended up with? And you will see that the desired family size is statistically about one child, a little bit less, below what they in fact got. So they uh, don't uh, refuse a child, but they would have liked to have fewer children. And if you, in this circumstance, if you offer voluntary family planning, you have an amazing uh, effect. People just use it because they don't want to have these big families anymore. Um, so give couples access to voluntary contraception as Thailand did, as Bangladesh did, many other countries did, and you will see a, an enormous uh, re reduction in uh, fertility and spacing of children. 
Before that works, you have to make sure that infants survive because no country, and they are right, and no family has ever reduced fertility when they see their children die. So that's a precondition. Now, here you see uh, what Thailand did. It's just uh, mind-boggling. You see 1976, they have a total fertility rate. That's roughly the numbers of children per, per woman of 5, 4.9. Within 10 years, they brought this down to 2.3. And then further down, just by offering uh, voluntary family planning uh, the, uh, contraception. But you may be astonished to see that population still increase. That is a demographic law. There is kind of a wave that is pushed forward and it's only plateauing off way after the, the fertility is, is declined. The next slide shows you that uh, this is only possible because life expectancy, that means child survival uh, essentially, has also increased. In, uh, in uh, middle income countries, that is the, the black line, that's Thailand for example, they have made uh, huge uh, increases in life expectancy. They have added 50% of life expectancy in one generation and that is uh, just wonderful and is the precondition of fertility decline. So I hope to have shown you that it matters uh, how many feet there are to create a carbon footprint and that we should uh, help families to make their decision, which is usually to have fewer children and better space children, in the benefit of health and in the benefit of climate. So again, our slogan is true, what's good for the climate is good for health. Thank you very much.